connection space. Okay, then. So, Alan, you have the word. Okay, I, I was right. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, gentlemen, for ladies and gentlemen, whoever's listening, if this has been a problem. I'm going to try and answer four basic questions, which we all need to understand if we're going to be able to tackle the problem. First of all, we need to understand the real problem and the issues involved in this, because it may not be what you think it is. We have to look at the key issues involved in road safety, in the developing world especially, and how we need to address these. There are actually some lessons we can learn from the developed countries who have been very successful. In fact, not only developed, there are a number of low and middle income countries who have actually demonstrated success, and we can apply some of those skills and experiences to other countries. And last question is, is there evidence that we can improve things in our developing country? I believe there is significant evidence, which I will show you. And we will also look at financing, which is a fundamental problem in many countries. Okay. Understanding the problem. Let's make sure we understand what it is. Road safety problems happen in the transport sector, on the transport network. But in fact, the problem is not only a transport problem. There are many, many other agencies involved who have to be involved, the police, the, the of course, the uh, health agencies, education, and so forth. Often, in an early stage of development, the transport ministry doesn't work so well with the other agencies. Clearly, there's sometimes a dysfunctional relationship with the engineers and the, and the police often fighting for territory. And therefore, you don't get the same degree of cooperation as you get in the more developed countries. But more importantly is that transport does not suffer the consequences of road accidents. This happens in the Ministry of Economy. The government and the, the country, the economy suffers. There's the hospitals where sometimes 30% of the, the patients may well be uh, in the emergency wards are from road accidents. There's a social impact. As Matthias said, many thousands of people are, develop, are disabled, perhaps for life and their families will suffer, both in terms of looking after the disabled person, but also the extra cost. It's a particular problem for the women, because young girls are often taken out of school, and they are then left to look after the person who has been injured. And this can be a limiting for the, the young women of, of the society. So transport is no, road safety is not a transport problem. It's an economic problem. Road crashes typically cost three to 5% of the annual GDP of a country. Most productive age groups are actually being killed. These are the young people that have been trained and educated and who will be the future economy of a country. And I will show you later that this is a real problem. Economic losses in most countries, in many countries, are actually greater than the total aid that they received. I've done some analysis of the EU, European Union. This is the biggest group of countries more than half of the total world aid comes from the European Union countries now. 80% of those countries that they give aid to actually lose more money from road accidents than the total aid that they receive. So the aid is actually not as effective as it should be. It's a health problem. As others have said, as, as Matthias and others have said, 1.3 million people dying, perhaps up to 50 million people being injured. It's the leading cause of death now to 44 year olds. This is killing the young, bright futures of many countries. Road deaths exceed those that come from malaria. And by 2030, there'll be double the number of deaths from really, and four times as many as to It's also a poverty and social development problem. We said in many countries, it's the families are driven into a spiral of downward uh, income, and this can be a major problem for them. Okay, what can we think about, about road safety? What things do we have to think about? 
you know, one aeroplane crashed in Ukraine uh, from Malaysian Airlines. It was knocked out of the sky. Another plane crashed somewhere in, in Asia. 250 to 300 people died. There was worldwide information about this next day. We, we're still talking about those plane crashes almost a year later. Yet every single day, there are 10 jumbo jets worth of people crashing. Imagine if the 10 jumbo jets crashed every single day. 3,300 deaths a day. Nobody would fly in the world if there were 10 jumbo jet crashes every day. Or a 9-11 twin tower tragedy every single day. 365 days a year, year after year after year. But little or no action is taken at the moment because these things happen in ones and twos. And no one takes the big picture of the global problem. And the problem is actually much, much bigger than we think it is. Because it's like an iceberg. What you have is only the surface is actually shown. Because the police and others report only what is reported to them. So if you have a ship coming along like this, there's a massive amount of unreported information that often isn't in the situation. We have, for example, in the Western countries and European countries, typically for one death, we would expect to have about 8 or 10, 12 serious injuries, possibly 50 to 60 slight injuries. Now, in many countries that we're working in, we know the police report, for example, a recent country I was in just yesterday, um, for every one death, they only report three injuries. In some other countries, for one death, typically six injuries, which means a whole number of unreported injuries which are just not entering the system. Internationally, we would expect for one dead, total of around 70 injuries, some of them being serious. So this is a huge underreporting. Secondly, there's all these crash, uh, damage-only crashes. There could be as many as 100,000 in a country, which are not even recorded often in police statistics. This is a cost to the country. Sorry, I lost my, my apologies. OK, let's go back. OK, let's look at the next one. This, along the bottom axis, is the age. The age at which people would die. This is the percentage of people who are killed at each age by, by different causes. You can see here that, for example, cancer takes a long time. So as you get older, more people die from cancer. Again, heart disease. As you get older, more people will die from heart disease. Brain disease, same thing again. As we, sorry, as we get brain disease, more people get, as they get older, they get, but look at this, road accidents. Deaths, I'm sorry, it keeps moving. My apologies, let me go back. This one, as people die, they die from the age of 15 to about 44. This is the bulk of the people who die in road accidents. This is the future of a country. These are the young, productive people who may have 30, 40 years of production after they have qualified. And they are dying at the moment. And this is a major problem for the economies of the countries. The problem became so serious that many countries said this cannot be tackled by us alone. And in 2009, there was a big conference in Moscow called by the uh, uh, Moscow was a host. About 145, 147 countries came to this. Two and a half thousand people. The banks and the, all the countries came. Plus there was a hundred, over a hundred ministers of transport and and um, uh, health and uh, even uh, interior to discuss this problem. And they decided this is too big a problem for a single country and they passed it up to the United Nations and asked the United Nations to look at this and try to do something. The United Nations came up with a decade of action for road safety. They agreed, the 200 countries of the United Nations, that we need to do something as a national, as an international problem. And during the period 2011 to 2020, we should try and improve road safety. The various things are happening at national level, international level, a global plan of action. Countries have been asked, hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, we can, we can hear you. It uh, works quite good at the moment. Okay, good. Sorry. Okay. Uh, national activities are going on in each country. And basically, with the national activity plus the international activity, we hope to save many lives in many countries. Most countries are implementing a plan based on five pillars, looking at road safety management, coordination of safety, infrastructure, looking at road user behavior, this is teaching young children, this is uh, getting the attitudes of people changed, 
looking at safe vehicles, and looking at post-care, post-crash care, emergency services, etc. Now, if we can put a plan of action like this, the United Nations has made a, a, a draft of this, and even we've even made a template which other people can use. On I've, If somebody's interested, I can, I can give them a, a website where you can download a template to allow you to develop your own action plan for this period, this kind of thing. But the problem is very complex. It's multidimensional. If you look at it, there's international, national, provincial, municipal communities where things have to be done. There's international organizations, government organizations, private sector, NGOs, and local communities. There's technical areas, crash, uh, post-crash, safe roads, safer vehicles. So even if you took that five by five by five, 125 separate aspects need to be considered. So it's a, it's a complex problem. It's actually even worse than that because it's not a cube. It's a truncated pyramid. What means is that at the top end, you may have tens of, let's say, international organizations who need to be coordinated. At national level, there's hundreds, at least 200 countries. Provincial level, there's probably thousands of provinces. There's municipalities, tens of thousands, and communities, hundreds of thousands. If we are going to tackle the global problem, somehow we have to integrate these different groups together to start trying to address this problem in a systematic, coordinated way. A couple of small, I apologize for this, a bit of theory if you like, but this is the vehicle ownership curve. This is vehicles motorization. Let's say cars, private cars per thousand population. This is time, typically about 100 years. All countries start like this, slowly, gradually building up until you get to about 100 cars per 1,000 population. Then there's a rapid, rapid, very rapid increase up to about 300, 400 cars per 1,000 population. Then it starts to slow down. And after that, it only grows in line with population. So during this period, there's a suppressed demand where people want to have vehicles and more and more people will get them as soon as they have the income. But what it does mean is during this period, there's a rapid, rapid rise of vehicles. And this overwhelms sometimes the authorities who can manage. So unless you can tackle problems during this period, you will have major problems because it is not, the, the, the size of the problem will increase substantially. Let me give you an example from Sweden. This was Sweden from 1945, just after the war, to around 1995, just to sort of illustrate. It, I'm in 1990. This is not actual vehicle growth, but it's the use of vehicles, but similar. It's the S-curve. You can see it's vehicles per and vehicle kilometers. This is the ownership of vehicles and the use of vehicles here. This is number of deaths. And you can see in the early years, Sweden, like most developing countries, was trying to connect the major towns. And that's what we are all trying to do in many of the developing world. We then have a situation where traffic starts becoming a problem and the traffic police start doing more enforcement to to try to help regulate it. Again, a little bit further on, the traffic gets even more congestion, even more problems, and it starts to, the police no longer have the technical capacity to deal with it. You need to bring in the engineers. You have to, maybe traffic signals and lights and various technical issues have to be done to try to control traffic. You then have a problem that the engineers and the police for four or five years fight about the problem because each is trying to be responsible for this, and many countries go through that process. Eventually, the police and the engineers realize they have to work together to tackle the problem. Again, can everybody hear me? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you, Alan. So I've confirmed uh, something. Can... Okay, sorry. Okay, there's just a, a noise coming on. I thought maybe I was losing people. <laughs> no worries. And then eventually, when the police and the engineers start working together, they jointly then realize they have to work together in order to get the politicians and the media and the public engaged. At that point is where suddenly we start having movement. So basically, until we can get the agencies like the police and engineers, other agencies at professional level, working together more uh, willingly and wanting, instead of fighting each other, combine their resources to fight, if you like, the politicians and to mobilize the media, that is when you'll find things start to happen. The, the politicians, once they get pressure, from the media and from the public, plus they get the same story from all their technical people, then they start to take action. And typically an action plan is done, and then deaths start coming down like this, even though numbers of vehicles, ownership of vehicles, numbers of drivers continue rising. 
Now the problem is that's what we want to achieve and we're trying to achieve in developing countries at an earlier stage. So the issue is how can we do that? Okay, let's look at that. Second important thing to realize is road safety development is not dependent just on resources. Uh, it requires also a willingness to take effective action. If you look at this curve, this is road safety development and this is time. And again, it could be over 100 years, 50 years, whatever. At the very top, the best countries in the world, without a shadow of doubt, well, everyone agrees, are UK, Sweden and Netherlands. They're, they're ahead of everyone. They've got about three deaths for every 100,000 population. Then come the rest of Europe and European countries, typically with an average of around six deaths for 100,000 population. Then you end up with some developing countries who are starting to move. Then there's other countries who are a bit further behind. Then you've got other countries even further behind. Many of these countries in here are from Africa and some of them are from the Middle East. So here's Saudi Arabia, a very, very wealthy country, but has lousy road safety because there is not enough willingness by government to do something. They have the money, but not the willingness to do it. You get a country like, uh, small countries, Ghana, little African country, not very wealthy. And Malaysia, Indonesian, uh, an, uh, Asian country, again, they have recognized that road safety is an economic problem. It is not a, a, a transfer problem. And their economies can benefit if they can improve road safety. An interesting one is France. In 2004, France was like a developing country in terms of road safety. Everything else, of course, was fantastic. It's a lovely country, many uh, advanced features. But in road safety terms, the police and the engineers didn't work together. There was very, very poor safety of the roads. Um, you know, even, even the enforcement, there were many things that were wrong. President Chirac in 2004 took road safety under his own belt. And by 2009, five years later, France had reduced deaths by 45% because a higher level person. So the point was that at this level here, you cannot you will not have the agencies working well together. At this end, you don't need, it doesn't matter. In Sweden, it's the Roads Authority. In the UK, it's the Ministry of Transport. In Denmark, it's Ministry of Justice, I think. Different agencies can be responsible, and it doesn't matter because each agency will cooperate, will work with the others. Whereas down at this end, the agencies are not willing to work together. And you need a higher level authority to say, okay, you guys have got to work together to make this happen. And then, they will take action. I'm sorry, again, I keep losing it. All right. So th the point is, if you're down at this end of the curve, then you need to think about an appropriate structure which will allow you to be able to tackle the problem. That just copying what they do in Sweden or UK is not the answer because the structures are different. You will not be able to take their structure and say, right, we'll have a similar one here because your system will not permit that to happen. So we have to find a right a structure for action at this level and in fact at each level it varies as you go and in fact the structures change that's something else to note that you what you start with here maybe four years later you have to change it as you go on again you may change it this is this is development because what you require here is very different from what you require there okay let's next one let's look at the problem in the recent trends first thing is that in 1950 this is just after the war you see there was about uh, about 60 million vehicles in the world. By 1993, they had increased less than 45 years, 12 fold, 12 times the increase. So it's a huge increase in numbers of vehicles and the use of vehicles. More importantly, I want you to notice this yellow one. This is motorcycles. It wasn't a problem until 1980s really started becoming a problem. These are intrinsically dangerous vehicles and they are now basically becoming a major problem around the world, as I will show you. So this is what's been happening in the past. The net result of that was that when you look at the overall countries of the world, United Nations countries, many of the African countries, that's blue, that's UN uh, uh, Commission for Africa, many of these countries are having still very, very high rates in relation to the population. 30, 40, 50 deaths for every, uh, I'm sorry, in leads, hundreds in some cases, deaths for every 100,000 population. As you come down, yellow is Economic Commission for Asia, Pacific region, the yellow countries. The red is the UNECE, which covers part of this region of 
uh, that I'm currently in, in in the Central Asia. Some of the Central Asian countries, Kazakhstan and others, are still very, very poor. But then as you carry on, you have Latin America uh, coming in here, Caribbean, Latin America, that's green ones. Some are very poor, but some are not too bad. The best is here. This is mainly the European countries. The European Union has had a tremendous safety record over the last four or five decades. Almost every 10 years, there's been a reduction of 40 to 50 percent. Countries like Germany, France, Britain have demonstrated that even though all those easy things were done 10, 20 years ago, they're still able to reduce deaths and injuries significantly on a regular basis. Countries at this end who have not yet implemented many of the simple things have huge opportunity to reduce the numbers of deaths quickly because at minimal cost by applying some of the same techniques that were applied in this region. And this is part of the strategy we're doing at the moment in the region I'm working in. We're taking countries who have been very successful and say, well, what did they do at the relevant time? How did they manage to improve their system to try to improve safety and then try to apply those lessons in these 10 countries we're working in? The big problem for me, uh, shockingly, is motorcycles. I, I was, I've I been involved in safety for a long time and I was shocked. Recently I went to, to Latin America uh, to give some lectures and I looked at the growth of motorcycles but when you start looking at it at the overall globally, it was going at about 7% per annum. It then increased during the early 2005-2006 to nearly 9% per annum. More recently, it's running at around 13% and it's still going to continue at 13%. What that means is that globally there were 18 million motorcycles in 2000. By 2020 there will be 138 million. This is a six-fold increase in this period. Now of course what happens is the more motorcycles you have, the more deaths and injuries you're going to have on the roads. And this is causing major problems now around the world. When I started my road safety work, it was a problem largely in the 1980s. It was largely a problem of the developing world and it was a problem of Southeast Asia. This is where motorcycles were. They were a problem, we were dealing with it, starting to think they had the biggest problem. By 2000 in Iran there was one million motorcycles. By 2005 there were five million. There had been a five-fold increase over a five-year period. This is unbelievable. This is, this is the kind of talk in, increases I was talking about during this rapid motorization phase, whereas in the in the Western countries maybe a car is the first motorization you do. In a less wealthy country, a motorcycle is your personal transport and your whole family may be sitting on the car, vehicle with you, but this is where you get mobili mobility. So it becomes a major problem. In If you look at poor public transport in African cities, there's been a huge move to motorcycle taxis. So for example, Lagos had a thousand motorcycles, taxis in 1980. By 1995, 10,000, 200,000 by 2007, and I believe it's now well over a million uh, motorcycle taxis. Just in Lagos, one city, uh, at 30 to 40 percent of the traffic at peak time is now motorcycles. This can cause major problems. Though. In Kenya, motorcycle injuries are increasing at 29, nearly 30 percent per year. This is so the, the plague has come from there, is now taking over Africa as well and causing problems there. We then go even further. Mexico, from 1999 to 09, 300% increase in motorcycle death rate. In Brazil, from 96 to, uh, to 2007, 800% increase in motorcycle deaths. There's a huge movement here. Many countries in Latin America, 60 to 70% of the vehicles are now motorcycles. And this is a problem because these motorcycles are being financed by, of course, motorcycle manufacturers are happy to sell them, but they give no uh, no support. The countries end up having to pick up the cost because when people die or injured, they go to hospital. The country picks it up. When the people are injured, disabled, it's the country that has to pay for it. Motorcycle manufacturers are providing motorcycles without any ex extra responsibility. And I have been arguing for many years, they should be providing two free motorcycle helmets, good helmets with every motorcycle. You would not dream of a car being sold now without seatbelts. So why do we let the motorcycle manufacturers 
let sell their, their vehicles and make lots of profits without taking responsibility. In addition, I would say they should have to be uh, give a voucher for four-hour training that anybody buying a motorcycle gets two free helmets plus he gets a voucher to go to any driving school where he can be given four hours of films and so forth showing the, the importance of conspicuity, how to ride a motorcycle in the wet conditions and basically give some education about the dangers of motorcycle riding and how you can be saving yourself by being more conspicuous, by being careful during wet weather, etc. Now, if motorcycle manufacturers would do that, then maybe we might get start getting some of this problem solved. So, moving on. The problem is actually growing much faster than we can deal with it. This is the other big problem. We have unsafe, unhelmeted motorcycles growing. It's like a balloon here. We have different people blowing into this balloon. The problem is getting bigger, and many of us who are dealing with safety are running behind. We're not able to catch up with the problem. So unsafe, unhelmeted motorcycles. You have unsafe vehicles. The, I was talking about Latin America. Many unscrupulous motor, motor vehicle manufacturers. You can buy a motor. Well, you have. Currently, right now, you have this problem of uh, Volkswagen, a serious problem for the, for the Volkswagen uh, uh, manufacturer. They are having trouble because of, let's say, cheating the system to make the lower emissions. But more importantly, is in Latin America, the NCAP testing, which is testing of new vehicles, showed that when you start testing vehicles, which apparently look exactly the same on the surface as a vehicle in the USA or in, in Europe, it, on surface looks the same. It costs the same or even a little bit more. But many of the safety features that we have in vehicles in Europe and the USA do not get put into those vehicles. So when the testing was done, they end up being one star or two star vehicles, when the same vehicle in Europe would be a five star vehicle. So this is unscrupulous let's say selling and it happens because the countries do not have good legislation. All they have to do is simply say you will not send us a vehicle which does not comply with let's say EU uh, regulations, European uh, conventions or even the US ones. They are quite strong and as long as it complies with those requirements and all manufacturers make vehicles which comply but for selling in Africa or Latin America they will actually take out some of the safety features and sell that vehicle at the same price, although they know it's a less safe vehicle. So this is again unscrupulous dealers. So here we have people who are profiting at the expense of the public. We have unsafe roads happening, despite the fact that the World Bank, ADB, EBRD, all of them are providing funding for roads. All of them nowadays insist on safety audits being done, yet not all of them will insist that the recommendations of the safety audit is put in place. So many road authorities in each country are too busy, they want to build the roads. The road safety is an imposition and they don't see that they have an obligation to provide safe transport. So as a consequence, uh, people are having to are still building roads which will become dangerous, which will become in the next 10, 20 years um, black spots. And this is a problem for us. There are far too safety specialists with the ability to do effective work. We need to train, build capacity. We need more specialists in the developing world. And we need to find a way to really find a way to, to strengthen this capacity and make them better and give them opportunities of training. There's actually inadequate guidance available to those who need it. There's many, many manuals and documents are available which have been built over the years, but they're not systematically are made available to countries and to regions. For example, there are manuals which are more generic, more general, whereas a targeted manual, say, for the Middle East, or a targeted manual for the Central Asia, or a targeted manual for East Africa, West Africa, might be more acceptable because some people there would see it as being relevant with photographs and solutions which are relevant to their needs. So this is a real problem that we have to deal with. And those of us working in safety are frustrated because the problem is actually growing. And even though we have global level targets and we want to reduce deaths, we're actually fighting a losing battle. We are, unless we stop, first thing we have to do with a situation when it is worsening is, first thing we have to do is stop these things happening. So we need to address these issues and stop the problem growing. Then we can go back in and then fix those bits which were bad. But until we fix these, 
There's no point going in fixing this when we still continue to let this happen because that will continue the problem and we will never catch up. This is a, a, a particular road. It's unfair, in fact, that it was picked out because the person involved in this particular road is actually very keen and is interested in safety. He's in a great deal of safety in the World Bank. But nevertheless, this road, this is just an illustration of how reputation of an organization, this is a World Bank road in Bangladesh. This was a, I'm sorry, this was a, a, a Sunday paper, massive headlines uh, in, the, in the magazine and talking about unsafe roads in the developed world. And the banks, ADB, World Bank, want to end up with a road. The road things are missing for building coming from the developing world. No, I could almost go to any country and say, which are the worst, most unsafe roads in your country? And I would bet you that four or out of the five or eight or nine out of ten would be roads which have been recently rehabilitated by the World Bank or the EU or other uh, uh, international organizations. Not because these organizations don't care about safety, but because in doing this, not enough attention is put to the, the the communities through which those roads pass. And if you have a road which uh, you're going to rehabilitate and the speed will increase, for sure, more people will die. And whereas we look at the environment, we worry about the plants, we worry about the, uh, the, the, the fauna, small animals which might be injured as part of the environmental assessment, we don't equally give consideration to the people on that road. And therefore, as they pass through the community, we should be taking much greater care and making sure the speeds as they pass through those communities, linear villages, are much lower than they actually are on the normal open road. Okay, okay. what and lessons and can and we and learn and from and the and most successful and countries? And Hello? Alan, uh, could I yes? just... Are you here? Can you um, hear me? Uh, yeah, I, I can hear you. Um, I've just seen we, we have yes, yes. 12 slides and in about uh, yeah 12 minutes, um, the official time is actually over. Um, due to the technical delay, I think that's not a problem. Oh, so that you could uh, yeah, just in the normal uh, speed uh, f uh, finish your presentation, and we would uh, right. put the, the we will a little bit delay and uh, ha have ten or fifteen minutes time for discussion. Uh, okay, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll run through it very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But uh, just uh, not too too, too basic. Yeah. yeah, I understand. I'll, okay. I'll keep it fairly quickly now. It's very I'm nearly there. To yeah. Okay. 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 Two two fundamentals. This is a multi-sector activity. No, the police or the engineers cannot fix it. We need to mobilize all the other agencies. It's like a pizza pie. We all have to make sure they can do their part of the business. They cannot do that unless they get access to craft data, and we need to understand. So we have to introduce a scientific approach to road safety. So two things are fundamentals. We need to be multi-sector, plus we need to get good data and analyze it and make every agency work. The data should be brought together from the police, from the hospitals, brought together with other data and made available to every agency so they can tackle the problem. We need to bring coordination into the system so the government agencies, the business and the community can be brought together through some sort of national safety council to improve safety. This is very, very important. We need to have some kind of coordinating body to try to bring these agencies together. Very importantly, at the early stage of development is you need to have a full-time, not part-time, full-time permanent secretariat who will follow up, chase up, do things, plus a small amount of money to allow them to do the cross-sector work. And ideally, it should be under the prime minister's office or the prime minister or the president's office. So you have the higher level of authority, which means the ministries will then do what they are told. I won't bother with this one. Okay, we need to do vertical integration and horizontal. All the stakeholders have to be working, but we also have to have activity going on at province level, municipal level, because you cannot fix safety just by standing at the at a national level and saying, we have a strategy. We have to implement it at local level. Just a very quick thing, in Japan, France, Australia, to show that it is possible in Japan under the Prime Minister's office, 50% reduction in deaths. France, 
43% reduction under the President's office. Australia, again, so it's possible to make major improvements and these countries have already done all the easy things. In a developing country where, for example, seat belts are not fully used, to increase the seat belts to say 90%, you will get a 20% reduction guaranteed in deaths. There are many simple things we can do in the developing world which are not being done yet. Okay. Here's an example of some countries. These are all ex-Soviet countries, developing countries, and they, since they came into Europe by applying the European approach, have all reduced deaths 40, 50, 60 percent. Not because they were smarter or something, but simply by taking on board the approaches that Europe has used and implementing those proven solutions. There are even non-EU, these are all in the EU now, European Union, but even countries like Serbia, which is outside Europe, has actually had a 43% reduction in deaths over the period. So it is possible for a country to apply simple techniques to do it. And importantly for me is European Union, despite having previously every decade reduced deaths, still continues to reduce deaths by about 40% per year. Very simple thing, investment. The amount of investment going into HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, road crashes, this is the number of deaths annually, by the way. We are killing more people than malaria. We're going to kill more than tuberculosis. We're going to be killing more than them in HIV within the next 20, 15 years. The amount of funding that has gone into these three areas, these two there, HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis, $18 billion. The amount of funding that's gone to road safety in the past, $160 million. This is a disparity. We are actually have a bigger problem, but it is not yet recognized as a global issue, or at least not adequately recognized. A solution, how could we do it? One of the problems we have is development banks have money, they want to lend, but governments will not borrow. There are donors like GIZ, others, UK agents, different, who give aid to governments as part of development. Why don't we use a part of that aid and let the, 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 because the government cannot give a guarantee, perhaps let the donor give the guarantee and hold some money back, give only part of the money to the government and let that bank, the development banks, put some money in to do an implementation of a safety program. And if it is successful, the government can then make that saving and then repay the, the World Bank or, or perhaps convert it into a loan. And the money that was held here as a, as a uh, as a guarantee can be handed over to the government. So as a catalyst, the money here does not have to be used. There are many simple ways that one can look at, innovative ways to save, to, to apply safety. Lastly, Uh, Alan, I think we lost you for the last minute or so. Um, I was at the point where you explained the development impact partnerships, and uh, I think for your your last sentences they, they they just got lost a bit. But generally, it's uh, not the problem. So you may just uh, continue. How can a reach, uh, country reach its goal? Hello? Oh, Alan, uh, we can hear you, yeah. We can hear you now. Okay. We, sorry, sorry. Since the last slide on the development impact partnerships or impact bonds, uh, we, we couldn't hear you, so so you may... Uh, oh, dear. You okay, may well, there's, the main there's message two, two slides. Okay. All right, I, I can just finish it. We're almost there. I mean, just simply, I think I've covered most of the ground now. But I was going to say, we need to, okay, I was just giving the, the German slide saying, okay, systematically, what Germany can, has done 
and was was very successful. So there's plenty of experience of good countries which have done well, and I think we can share that experience from the European Union to developing countries. So Matthias, do you want to take over now, and uh, do we have some questions? Hello. Yeah, I can I can take over now. That is okay. Let or or me... any questions? Yes. If yeah. anybody has questions. One second. I, I will lead over to that. Um, in a minute, just please let me take back the control. I will use this one, and you should now be you should now be able to uh, see the presentation here on my side, and I will switch to that slide. Don't know why it doesn't show it. Okay, now you should be able to see it. Yeah, so uh, first of all, Alan, many thanks for, for this comprehensive presentation. And I think we, we, we understood, uh, you made very clear that the, the main challenges that, that lay behind uh, every single country. And uh, also you, you, you mentioned some of the strategies, how to push the decision makers to, 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 to act and uh, which strategic partnerships can be created to really advance uh, road safety for any country. Uh, in particularly interesting, I found the point that you said that uh, while the concepts are very clear, uh, what has to be done to, to advance road safety, uh, this still cannot just be implemented by any country in the way it is implemented in another country. So that yeah. every country has to find its own strategy and its own structure to do the things. So there may be different partners to involve in one country and the things might just work differently. But uh, the important stuff is that, that the, the, the measures, the actions which have to be done are quite clear and there's comprehensive uh, documentation. And that's pretty good. Yes. Uh, on that one, uh, just I would uh, quickly say that, uh, I mean, we have seen a lot of graphics. Um, that is a, a poster, what you can see here, is a poster that we have developed within the German Partnership for Sustainable Mobility. And with our partners, we, we try to analyze the, 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 the different steps, the different measures over the last decades, what has been done in Germany, what has been implemented. And uh, we have put over the graph of how the road fatalities develop. So you can clearly see that the things that you, that you do at a certain point, they will have an impact uh, in, in further decades. So that will is uh, this poster is available uh, at the web page that you can see in the top of the slide. So uh, you are invite, so I invite you to, to just have a look at it and to study it uh, maybe. And for other countries, it, it, it looks similar uh, in Europe or in other countries uh, worldwide that have been successful in implementing road safety measures. Um, so I would like to lead over to the discussion a little bit if there are some questions. Um, interesting to, to see that there, there has been actually kind of a, a parallel discussion in the, in the chat meanwhile. Um, so there's still still the point, how do we convince and how do we finally make decision makers act? So there's the, the, the point of financing. So either money is not allocated to road safety, but we have heard that, that this is a question of, of pressure to putting pressure on decision makers. Yeah. Um, and uh, it is still a challenge well, maybe, maybe can, that we well, let me comment on, on that one because, on safety. Uh, can, I, can I just comment on that one yes uh, please. Two, two, I think there's two, two issues here first of all you need to convince the government that in expenditure in road safety is not a cost it's an investment so I increasingly nowadays uh, I use a financial argument the country is losing typically 3 to 5 percent of its GDP. Ga calculate, there's an estimate can be made based on some, uh, again if somebody's interested we can give you some references, but there's a methodology, uh, say 70, 70 times the GDP per capita times the number of deaths in a country, plus 17, 17 times the GDP per capita times the number of injuries reported in the country. If you add, multiply, add, add those up, that will come out to uh, an approximate uh, figure for the, the cost or losses in a country. That's number one. And that can be used until more detailed cost is available within a country. Second thing is that you can use things like the insurance industry, for example, to finance activities. If you have, for example, for example right now in Ukraine, there are 10 million vehicles. They have a compulsory third-party policy. If you took just, which costs about 50 or $60 to buy, if you took just $5 per policy, that's $50 million 
potentially available for road safety. So one can look at the insurance industry and the why they will be willing to invest because they will, if you reduce deaths or injuries, they will pay out less money. So you can look for clever mechanisms which will actually be beneficial to the participants and they make more money in profits in future by investing a small amount now. Plus you can find things like this innovative financing, different mechanisms so the government doesn't have to pay so much. Maybe you should find a way that the government pays by results. Like I'm saying that if you can actually reduce the number of deaths in a country, the government will benefit and maybe that can be used to finance safety. So I think the Ministry of Economy or Ministry of Finance is the one that we have to convince, not so much the transport or police, because the finance or Prime Minister's office will decide how much money is allocated. Yes, so uh, thank you, Alan. Um, okay. We had, um, oh, give me just one second. There, there, there was uh, quite a huge discussion in the, in the chat function, meanwhile, and it is good that, that, that you mentioned um, the, the road safety development impact bonds and which partnerships could be created. Yes. So I think uh, I would advise to the to the uh, to our uh, to the people who are interested in this question to to approach uh, Alan directly, as uh, he really got into the idea of of creating new me mechanisms, which also include the international financing organization, the de development banks, and so on. Um, we have here. We have here another um, one. One second. When you, ref I would just read the question here. Uh, when you refer to investments in road safety, um, do you also include engineering yes. and infrastructure, or just education, enforcement, yes. policy, no, and no, road no. safety management? Would you like to answer? Of course. That? As I said, you have to. Yes, I mean it's a multi-sector problem, and of course, engineering is a very, very important part. It has to be. It's not just education and so forth, because Education will take 20 years before you will see the results. Engineering, a good engineer can, within days, as soon as you implement and make certain movements not possible or speed reduction possible, you can immediately have an effect. So absolutely, you need to invest in a number of areas, but definitely engineering is one of the most important ones that you need to invest in. You need to invest in the crash data system to make sure you understand the problem better to see why the accidents are happening. And then if it's an engineering problem, fix it. You also need to invest in enforcement to make sure that right enforcement is done. Drink driving, you need to invest in making sure the seat belts. I told you, that's a simple measure, which virtually no cost, yet can have a 20% reduction in deaths. Most engineering uh, improvements or black spots can give you hundreds of percent rate of return. It's probably the single most cost-effective investment any country can make in anything because there's nothing that gives you you spend you know 10,000 20,000 euros maybe and you might end up with a million euros saved in the in the, because of the death energy saved at that location so definitely engineering investment but investment need is needed in a number of areas but a major one would definitely be in infrastructure and in investment both in terms of checking future roads the roads which are being built by checking the designs safety audits making sure unsafe roads are not built and secondly identifying the hazardous or dangerous locations on the network and then having systematic action plans to eliminate those and one of the best ways of doing this is making statutory responsibility make the road authority responsible for improving safety at the moment they don't care because they don't suffer only the health and ministry of economy suffer so we need to make the road authority have to make a report at least once a year on what was the safety situation at the beginning, what is at the end, and what have they done. That forces the authority, whether it's a national authority, municipal, or provincial authority, to do something about safety. Yeah, thank you, Alan. That that actually leads to the next question that we have here, and I think we and I hope we succeed in in making road safety a, a truly economic issue. Uh, and that it is perceived by the decision makers worldwide uh, in this way. There's another question from, um, from sorry, from Dejan Jovanov, uh, and uh, he raised a point that is interesting for the for the reporting that you just mentioned. So on road safety action plans, we have a lot of measures, uh, so they pretty well describe the way forward, but often we don't have clear impact indicators uh, yeah. that institutions could follow. Um, uh, what is your experience in that? 
Yes, well, I, I think there's two issues again here. There's different types of impact indicators. Obviously, the best is if you can have casualty reductions, but that's often, in a developing country, also is not going to happen for a long time because you have first the institutional issues to sort out. So often, one of the things, we, for example, in this project, what we're doing is we benchmarked at the very beginning uh, using, uh, again, if somebody's interested, if you go to the Traseca website and you can actually see on that site, this this road safety project, there's a benchmarking report where we actually went to each country and we did an assessment of where was that country in terms of institutional development. For example, okay, if you're saying that coordination management, I know if that's going to work, I need to have legislation in place, I need to have some kind of coordination body in existence, I need to have some kind of secretariat who will follow up and do the actions and I need some funding, small amount of funding to make the cross-sector uh, um, coordination. Now, if those four things, uh, I can check in any country saying, well, to what extent? Is it 10% or 50% or 100%? I can make an assessment. So, for a developing country, you need to look at the institutional indicators of development as well as the casualty reduction. Of course, everybody wants, but my experience has been if you can get the structure right, if you get the institutions working correctly and focus on that, safety will happen because then you have the right structure in place and the right sort of institutional uh, capacity to do the, do the actions. So there is a, again, if you go to that site, actually that, that, the Traseca website, uh, traseca-org.org, -org, I think it is, uh, and you will find that there is a, a section on this road safety project, uh, regional project, and there's actually a very good benchmarking report which describes a, a way of, and, and it actually gives the actual assessment framework that we used. So that gives a very, in two or three pages, gives a very, very clear idea, both for safer vehicles, safer roads, safer uh, management. It identifies the kind of indicators that can be used uh, to, to help you assess uh, things. Okay, thank you, Alan. I think we, we need to come to an end, but I found a kind of interesting comment from a participant from uh, Iran still. And he mentioned, so Mohsen Fala, he mentioned that uh, despite a decrease in road fatalities, that there is uh, still, that there is a recently a sharp increase in injuries. So that is quite uh, interesting uh -huh. um, yeah, as that differs. So that has but something to do with emotion. Yeah, but but also, because um, some, some comments on, on yeah. that. No, no. Yeah, Matthias, what, what happens is, the good thing is when you reduce deaths, what happens is many of them will be converted into injuries. So this is why often your serious injuries might increase or your slight injuries might increase. For example, if more people are wearing seatbelts, yes, they may be injured, but they will not die. Or if you have better roads or safer roads, which are more user friendly, somebody who would have previously died now has an injury. So often you find a country which has a reduction in deaths, significant reduction, will actually have an increase in injuries. But that's, that's okay. The injuries are costing less to the country and less, obviously, uh, ideally, you should try to minimize those. So most countries try to minimize uh, deaths and serious injuries. That is the, the, for example, in the UK, that's our target. It's, yeah, okay. Um, the, sorry, Alan, at the moment the connection seems to have quite some problem. So, so we can't hear you but, uh, clearly. Uh, a death to a serious injury or a serious injury to a slight injury, that's... Okay. okay. You get what I said about the fact that when you have a reduction in deaths, usually it's because those deaths have become injuries. That's why, you know, what would <laughs> be right. people who would have died are now injured. So, of course, you tend to get an increase in injuries sometimes. Okay, Alan, thank you one more time for the question. As at the moment, we have uh, a few audio uh, interferences. It, uh, the connection is not so stable anymore. Uh, but until now, it worked well. So, uh, I'm really glad for that. Um, and I would just give some final info. So, uh, first of all, many, many thank you Hello. for your explanations, for your, um, for your presentation, and for the new ideas that you have, uh, that you have uh, shared.
Um, I would now actually mute you as, as there's some some interference. Okay, and I would uh, just like to to share some further information uh, with you where you can find uh, more information on road safety issues. So first of all, I would like to uh, recommend you the urban road safety module of the Sustainable Urban Transport Project, um, which is uh, available for free download online in in altogether five languages. Uh, recently, there has been published from the World Resources Institute a quite interesting publication that is focusing stronger on urban design, so you may have a look at that. Uh, and I'm not sure whether Alan uh, actually mentioned that. The European Commission is, of course, doing a lot on road safety, so um, uh, I recommend to, to look on their uh, road safety portal, uh, where you can find specific information on any topic that is connected with road safety. Um, Further, if you are interested in joining a future event, uh, not only of us, uh, of our webinar series, but also uh, if you're interested in getting to know uh, information on training courses, on e-learning offers, on webinars, also by other stakeholders, you may just visit Capsu. There's a huge amount of uh, events available, which you can just scan for the topics which you are interested in uh, in detail. Uh, you can scan whether there are interesting events taking place locally in your region and uh, also we invite you in the case you are providing actually training offers in the field of sustainable urban transport to uh, promote your event also on on the Capsule webpage. Uh, on this slide you will find further information on our general work at GIZ in the field of transport and mobility. So we have an extensive uh, photo database at Flickr uh, we, are, we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, uh, we have a uh, huge amount of information on sustainable urban transport on the webpage sutp.org. Uh, you will get all those links in the presentation. And uh, I would like to thank you for your, for your attendance today. We hope to welcome you back in the future. And uh, an interesting yeah, for further information, we will share the presentation with all the attendees and we'll also upload uh, the recording uh, of today's webinar on capsule.org. So many thanks again for your attendance and uh, wish uh, all of you a good day. Okay, all right. Thank you, Matthias. So we'll talk soon. Okay, thank you, Ra Alan. Okay, all right.